Bible. I'm in Genesis, the first chapter. Put your finger there and then flip all the way over to Colossians. Put your finger in Colossians. I'll be there in just a moment. I tell you that because some of you don't know where Colossians is. I'm going to give you time to find it. <laughs> Genesis 1, you can figure that out. It's right after the table of contents. But um, uh, I, I, want, I want to help us all get better. And the truth of the matter is uh, great families aren't made overnight. Um, they take time. Uh, they take effort. They take consistency. They take uh, 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 c- continually working on it. Today, I, I kind of want to give you, I always like to tell you where we're going before I get there. And in, in this series, we'll talk about marriage a little bit. We're going to talk about single people a little bit. We're going to talk about raising kids. I'm actually bringing you a message, maybe the first time uh, I've ever done this. I'm going to bring you a message uh, about parenting and what the Bible says about parenting. I, I have an almost 13 year old and a 10 year old, and um, so I don't have all the answers. Uh, and I don't want to hear your horror stories. Keep all that to yourself. Uh, but, but I am going to give you everything I have. I, I, I like to say it this way. I'm going to empty my cup into yours. It may not be enough to fill you up, but, but we'll go to God together and God will help us all. Amen, everybody? We need God's help to be good parents. We need God's help to have good marriages. We need God's help in all of this. And, uh, and we're going to talk about we're going to talk, th- th- this introduction. So I, I'll get to all that in the next couple of weeks. But this introduction, I want to help you set up the idea of what an ideal family is to God, what the ideal family is to God, because we live in a world that's kind of filtered. You know what I mean? Like, like we filter everything in our lives. We filter, anybody know what I'm talking about? Like when you see a, like a filtered picture on, on social media, you know what I mean? Like, or if you're on a dating app, if you're single, if you're on, you know, christianfarmers.com or whatever it is that you go to look for. So, I don't know, <laughs> oldguysdating.com, whatever it is that you're looking at. And you see, like we all have filtered pictures, right? Like, like on your screen, they look like Beyonce. And then you meet them in person and they look like Snoop Dogg. Are y'all with me on that, everybody? <laughs> y'all with me on this? If you don't know who those people are, don't Google either two of those people. But, but we just live in this kind of filtered world where we want, and maybe you come to church and you kind of have a, that Christian family filter, you know, like, like we didn't cuss on the way in today. We didn't fight. We didn't do that. You know, we just listened to, you know, uh, Maranatha music. And we just, you know, we just, we were singing in the car together, holding hands on the way to church. And then, and then, and then, you know, we got out and we put on our Christian smile. And the truth is you were fighting and fussing and cussing and carrying on and, 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 and our families are broke. And, and we have this ideal of what family ought to be. And we get it from a lot of places. We get it from Disney movies. At the end of every Disney movie, every Disney story, it says they lived happily ever after. And you may look at your life and think, man, this isn't happily ever after. And, and, and we get it from the movies. We get it from the Hallmark Channel. Y'all with me on the Hallmark Channel on this? The Hallmark Channel has 10 actors. <laughs> they, they have four plots and they have 300 movies. And it's the same thing over and over and over and over and over. It's the big city girl comes back to the you know, small town and gives guys like me hope. You know what I mean? Small town, the eastern Arkansas boy get hope. But, but you look at your life and you watch the Hallmark Channel and you think, man, my life's nothing like that. This is in my family. And everybody has an ideal. You know, little girls, I have an almost 13-year-old who's serving in this service. And, uh, and, and she's, she's, she, uh, we saw the other day, she'd been looking at, she borrows our phones because we don't have phones at 13. And so that was free. I didn't even put that in the notes. But anyway, she was, borrowed one of our phones. She's looking at wedding dresses, you know, because that's what little girls do. And, 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 and they write down the names of their kids. You know, when you have little girls in their notebooks, they write, you know, you know Haley and Kaylee and Bailey and <laughs> Paxton and Jackson and Braxton and, you know, all, all, the, all, the, all the names of their kids, you know. And they, and they write their, their name and the last name of the boy. Are y'all with me on that, everybody? Like, women have this ideal. They think about the wedding dress. They think about the wedding day. They think about being carried across the threshold. They think about their perfect house. They named their kids. All the women. Is that, is that your men do not dream this way? When men think about family, they dream about sex twice a day and three times on Saturday. Can I get a good amen, everybody? That's it. Men are dreaming about hot wings and cold drinks in a man cave served by their wife. Are y'all with me on that? And that's it. They don't plan any further than that. How of you men are still dreaming? Come on, everybody, still, still dreaming. Still, all the married men still dreaming that this could be the thing. We have this ideal, like I think it's going to look like this, and then it doesn't look like that. 
you know, I think it's going to be this way. I, I think, and, and the truth is the world has an ideal, but it's not working. 50% of marriages don't make it. And by the way, that number's the same in the church and outside of the church. Like it's just true that family's broken and maybe you come from broken families and kids and this and that, and you realize that, that there's this real in our world that makes you really wonder, is, is it even possible to have a blessed family? Is it even possible to have you know, this, this thing. And if you don't hear anything else that I tell you today, I want you to hear this emphatically. It is possible for you to have the blessing of God on your family. You are not too far gone. It's not too bad. You didn't come from too dysfunction. It is not too broken that our God can give you a blessed family. Shout amen to that, everybody. You can, you can, but it's hard. So for the next couple of weeks, we're going to talk about marriage and parenting and relationships and singles and married and parents and single parents and soon to be parents and divorced and remarried and thirsty. Come on, everybody, look at, look in and, and this series is really for everyone. But every time we talk about family, it kind of brings up all these ideas. You know, when you say father, uh, sometimes people have this image of their father and, and sometimes it's good and you had a good dad and man, you think that, you know, this is, I love this. It brings up good, some of the, the truth of the matter is sometimes it's not. We come from all kinds of different places, blended families, second marriage, third marriage, between marriage, adoption, uh, 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 trying to adopt, uh, uh, fostering kids, raising kids, raising somebody else's kids. Some of us are single parents. Some of us have a spouse serving overseas in your way. Some of us buried our spouse. It's incredibly complicated and diverse, our families today. It's, it's incredibly challenging, and, and so we need some help in this and it, and it, and it hurts when you think about father sometimes and mother and brother and sister. And sometimes it brings good memories and happiness. And sometimes it brings anger and bitterness and everybody's got baggage. Can I just say that to you as you look across church today and you think, man, if that fa- if I had what that family had, man, I wish I was, I wish those were my parents, man, I wish that was my family. Can I just tell you, everybody's got issues. And if you think you don't have issues, that's your issue, <laughs> right? If, if you look at your family and think, man, I don't think we're, the thing, we're, we're not that broken. Listen, everybody in your family is thinking about you right now. <laughs> you know, everybody's thinking, man, I hope he listens. Because everybody has something. So what do we all have in common? And the truth is, with all those different kind of things, we don't have a lot in common. But I want to give you a couple of things we can all agree on, okay? So if you're taking notes, because all Christians take notes in church, write this down. Uh, When it comes to your family of origin, write this down. When it comes to your family of origin, you didn't get a choice. You didn't have a choice in the matter. Uh, You don't get to pick your family. Uh, You don't get to pick your parents. Uh, you, you you, You don't get to pick your family of origin. You don't get to pick where you were raised, what side of the tracks you were born on. You don't get to pick the socioeconomic level you were born into. You don't get to pick your family of origin and their dysfunction and their trauma. You don't, you don't get to pick all of that. You get to pick your friends, but you don't get to pick your family. And the truth is, sometimes you wish you could pick your friend's family. Are y'all with me on that, everybody? You remember in middle school, you had that friend that you would go over their house and they could eat Twinkies and cupcakes every day and you got to eat green beans at your house? Go with me on that, and you're like, man, they got they got a cool family. Their mom lets them stay up late. Their dad has tattoos and plays video games all the time. And I want to live with them. They don't have any rules. They eat Lucky Charms for supper. They wash it down with chocolate milk. I got to go home. I got to I got to be with this family. I didn't even choose this family. I remember one time I came home and told my mom that my mama looked me right in the eye. She said, "You can go live with them if you want to." Then I didn't. I stayed right there at home. But I wish I could. We don't get to pick our family of origin. We don't get to pick where we come from. We don't get to pick that childhood trauma. We don't get to pick that daddy that walked out. We don't get to pick that abusive mother. We don't get to pick the trauma of our childhood. Here's the second thing we can all agree on when it comes to family. Write this in your notes. Not only can you not pick them, but no one you're related to is as smart as you are. Isn't this true? Nobody's as smart as you are. You ever look around the dinner table thinking, man, I could help these people if they just let me. You ever looked around the family reunion and first of all, the first thought you have is, I'm adopted. No way I'm from here. 
No way. But the second thought you have is, man, I could fix these people if they would just let me fix them. You know what I mean? I could just, I could tell them. I got that one aunt that drinks too much. I got that one uncle that, that you need a job. You need to start posting on Facebook. You need, you need to stop playing video games. You need to stop eating ice cream. You need to take a bath. You need to stop drinking so much. I am smarter than everybody I'm related to. Can I get a better amen? And if they would just listen to me, and our family would be better. The truth of the matter is they're all thinking the same thing about you. Family's crazy. Family's difficult. And the truth is, listen, it's infinitely harder if you try to do it your way instead of God's way. Family becomes infinitely harder if you try to do it your way, my way, instead of God's way. So... We're going to go to God. I'm old enough to know that I don't know much, but I do know this, that I can find the answers to my life in God's word. That God's word is relevant. It is living and breathing. It helps me where I currently am. Can I get a good amen, everybody? I'm not going to look to Hallmark or Disney. I'm going to go to the Bible and say, what does the Bible say about family? Let me pause here and just look at you and tell you this. Uh, Somebody one time asked me, Pastor, why don't you just preach the Bible? You know, they were trying to be... They don't come to church here anymore. But anyway, they were, you know, why why do we have topical? Why why do you preach? Why don't you just preach the Bible? Look at me. Listen to me. The Bible is a family book. You can't get past the first chapter of the first book of your Bible without bumping into family trauma. So I am preaching the Bible when I tell us how to have good families. Are y'all with me, everybody? I get tickled at preachers sometimes that say, uh, we, we, you need, we need biblical families. You know, you need, to, you need to look for biblical families. I'm thinking, <laughs> you, you mean like Cain and Abel, biblical families? Like, don't, like that, uh, you, you be careful. Are y'all with me on that, everybody? Like, it's, it's, like you could be reading one day and you think it's Jerry Springer. It's just Old Testament. You know what I mean? Like. Like stuff just, it, the, the, you, you, you get right. To, matter of fact, Genesis 1, if you have a Bible, Genesis 1, 27. Are you there? Say, I'm there. Amen. Genesis 1 and verse 27. So God created mankind in his own image. And in the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. I just thought I'd pause there to remind you that there's only two choices and you don't get them. (laughs) You may feel like a unicorn, but you're either male or female. (laughs) You may feel like a pretty pony if you want to, but God did not make a mistake when he made you. Can I get a better amen, everybody? Verse 28, I want you to say this next three words out loud. Verse 28, God created male and female, and then God blessed. Say it again. God blessed. Now look at me. That's what I want for you. Honestly, the target of this series is for us to figure out how do we get that? Like, how do we get a family that God blesses? How do we get a marriage that God blesses? How do we get children that God blesses? How do we how do we get our marriage so strong that when our kids leave and go to college, look at me, married couples, they're going to leave you. They're going they're going to leave you and take your money. Are y'all with me on that? I mean, you're going to have to still pay for a lot of things, but they're going to leave you one day, and it's just going to be you and Mama, and y'all going to be looking at each other like, "Oh wow, hi, hi, how you doing? How are you?" I, didn't, I forgot your name. Who are you? Where, where are you? What, why are you here? What, what do we do now? Are y'all with me, everybody? I remind Brandy every day. She doesn't know this, but that little boy is going to leave her. She thinks that little boy loves her so much. I say, he's going to leave you for some little old Texas blonde. Are y'all with me, everybody? He's going to leave you. We want the blessing of God in empty nest. I want the blessing of God. How many of you want that in your family? I want the blessing of God in my life. The first recorded homicide in the Bible is a brother killing a brother. Adam and Eve's son committed murder, and it just it gets worse from there. Jesus, Jesus is left. You talk about biblical families. You talk about family trauma. Jesus is 12 years old, and his family literally leaves him for three days in the city before they recognize 
Has anybody seen Jesus? I've been, I've been preaching 25 years and, and my son's 10 years old. And two weeks ago, for the very first time in our lives, I left my son here at church. His mama thought I had him. I thought his mama had him. We both were on our way to the restaurant and my son thought he was Samuel, like he was going to have to live in the house of God all, every day of his life. <laughs> Thankfully, wonderful dream teamers picked him up and brought him. I tried to just give him, like, just y'all take him, just see what you can do, but... They just left Jesus. You talk about family trauma. You talk about raising up. Talking about mama, did, uh, really? This is what y'all think about me? Like it took y'all three days to even notice I wasn't here. That's family trauma. And everybody's got something. Everybody comes from something. But it's amazing when Jesus grows up. What happens in the New Testament is as he grows up and starts his ministry, everything starts to change, and he comes on the scene with these mind-boggling teachings about women and children. You see, in Roman and Greek culture, women were very, very undervalued. As a matter of fact, they're no much more than a possession, really just a little bit above cattle. And children are below that. They're stationed. Matter of fact, I was reading for this message that in, in Roman culture, they wouldn't even name their children until they were older because the infant mortality rate was so high. They didn't even, they didn't even give them a name. It was just boy or girl or you. They actually adopted, they would wait in Roman culture, they would wait till children were in their 20s and then they would adopt another 20 year old that they felt like was a better inheritor of their finances because they didn't trust their kid to handle their estate well. So they would go adopt another kid that they were just property. Some of y'all thinking about your 20 year old right now, think about doing that, aren't you? But it, it was, it was this culture that devalues women and devalues children. And Jesus walks on this scene and elevates the family and elevates women and elevates children. That's why it's so important. When the woman called in adultery, Jesus defends her against an angry mob of men. That's why it's so important when Jesus is teaching and the little children start coming and the disciples start to run them off. And he says, no, 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 no. Let the children come to me. It was huge. And so the apostle Paul takes the teachings of Jesus and goes all the way through the Mediterranean rim and begins to insert these teachings about family, elevating men and women and children, saying, God has a plan for your family. Say amen to that. God has a plan for your family. This is revolutionary teaching in this day. That God has a plan for your family. And honestly, it feels a little foreign in 2024. When family's under attack, when family, the nuclear family, mom, dad, and children together, it feels like it's under attack in culture and in Hollywood and in different places. It's kind of, it seems strange to say God has an idea for your family. God does have an ideal family. And I want to give it to you. Turn your Bibles to Colossians. I gave you time to find it. It's near the back. Colossians, if you're there, say I'm there. Yeah. Good, Colossians 3. I'm going to give you the ideal. Paul would teach the ideal family. Now, some of you men, before they put it on the screen, you're going to love this. Some of you men, this is your life verse. You just didn't know where it was. And now you're going to make a magnet of it and put it on your refrigerator and that... This is, this is it, but y'all buckle up because I got something for you, brothers. But we'll start in Colossians 3 and verse 18. The Bible says it like this. Wives, submit yourself to your husband as is fitting to the Lord. I knew nobody would amen. No, y'all too scared, aren't you? All you brothers is terrified. Y'all better be. Verse 19. Husbands, love your wives and don't be harsh with them. In the message, it says, don't be a jerk. I don't, it doesn't say that in the message. I just think it should. Anyway, don't be harsh with them. Verse 20, children, obey your parents in everything for this pleases the Lord. Verse 21, fathers, do not embitter your children. Another translation says provoke. Don't provoke or embitter your children or they will become discouraged. Wives, submit to your husbands. Husbands, love your wives. Don't be mean. Children, obey your parents in everything. And fathers, don't provoke your children. You don't have time to get there, but 1 Peter 3. Let me give you one more. 1 Peter 3, verse 7. I told you I was coming for you men. Husbands, 
In the same way, you husbands, give honor to your wives. All the women say amen to that. Give honor to your wives and treat your wife with understanding as you answer the door and pick up Amazon packages. (laughs) That was just for me. That that, That part was for me. Be considerate as you live with your wives. Treat them with respect. She may be weaker than you. Now, this is Texas. That, that may not be true. She may be stronger than you, but, but God designed her differently than you. That's all that means is God designed her differently, but she's your equal partner in God's gift of new life. By the way, in Christ, there's neither male nor female, Greek nor Jew. Don't, 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 don't come in here thinking, well, I'm, I'm male, hear me roar. No, no, no. In Christ, we're equal partakers of the new covenant. Say amen to that. We are. But you should treat your wife, watch this, as you should, so that... Your prayers are not hindered. Now, brothers, look at me in the eyes. You can pray till you turn blue in the face. And if you treat your wife poorly, the Bible, that's been in the Bible since you bought it. The Bible says your prayers just hit the ceiling. Now, that's something. Because I've counseled men who are frustrated at their life. And the truth of the matter is it has nothing to do with their faith. It has everything to do with how they treat their wives. Because when you treat your wives with honor and respect and love and you're not harsh, then God hears your prayers. Say amen. I thought women would shout more about that. I thought thought y'all would bring money to the platform about that. But anyway, so so here it is. This is God's idea. Listen, this is God's idea. Husbands, love your wives. Be respectful. Be considerate. Wives, submit to your husband. Children, obey your parents. And fathers, don't irritate your children. That's God's best idea. All right, let's pray. That's it. We're not going to pray. That's it. I got Because here's the truth of the matter. I'm looking at that and you're looking at that thinking, that ain't the life I got. That ain't how it is. That's not where I live. That's not the life that I have. Here's God's idea. Now listen, it would be easy for me to tell you, well, that's God's best idea. Just go do it. It's just easy. Just just go do it that way. The truth of the matter is we have God's best and God's ideal, and then we have what actually happens in my life and the real, and there's a gap in between there. There's a tension, and I didn't come from an ideal family, and you didn't come from an ideal family, and we don't have an ideal marriage, and we don't have ideal children, so what do we do? Do we just give up and say, well, this is just the way it's going to be. I guess I won't, I, I, I won't, I won't strive for anymore. I won't do anymore. I won't work on anymore. No, no, no. There's the real and there's the ideal and there's a gap, but God can help us close the gap in our life. Shout amen to that. As a matter of fact, write it down like this. Jesus pointed to and taught the ideal, but he refused to condemn those who fell short. That's what I love about the God of the Bible is that if you're in church today thinking, man, I, that is not my life. That is not our marriage. That is not my family. I got good news that you, there's no condemnation here today. But it doesn't mean we give up. It doesn't mean we just decide. I, I'm just, I'm just going to concede. And maybe that's where you are in church this weekend. Maybe on this first weekend of Family Matters, you're thinking, man, I've just kind of settled in. That this is my life. This is my family. This is my marriage. This is just what I got. I guess it's going to be this way. We've been married too long to change now. Things have gone this far, and and, and I guess this is just, and we lose sight of Scripture's idea, and so we just declare that what I'm doing must be normal. Everybody else must be dealing with this. It must just be this way. And you can if you want to, but you'll get the same results the world gets, and I want better for my life, and I want better for your life. I want our marriage, our children, and our families to be blessed. Shout amen to that, everybody. I want the blessing of the Lord on my family. I want the blessing of God on my family. And we can pursue God's best. And Jesus offers us grace when we fall short. And over the next couple of weeks, I want to help us to pursue God's best as a spouse and as a parent and a family. But I want you to know that there's grace for you. I don't want you to come to church feeling like, man, I can't ever live up to that. Never going to be that way. I want you to know that God can help you and God can help fill the gap. So let me close with this. I'm almost done. 
Just like every other area of our life, I'm going to give you some practical ways that, that you can live in the blessing of God and start closing the gap in your, in your family. Here's the first one. Write this down. If you, if you want the blessing of God on your family, if you, if you realize that, man, that sounds ideal, like I would love to get to that, but that's not where we are. And there's a gap in my family, if that's you. Write this down. We're going to seek God's best by seeking God. I know that seems so simple, but the truth of the matter is I found people who go looking for results instead of the work. But let me say it this way. Look into my eyes. The journey is the destination here. It really is. It's not about, God, I need the blessing of God on my family. It's about, no, I need God. And when I get God, I get the blessing of God over my life. It's really not, I need the blessing of God in my singleness. It's when I get God, I get the blessing of God while I'm in my single season. It's not, I need the blessing of God on my business. It's that I need God. And when I get God, he blesses everything I put my hand to. It's not I need the blessing of God over my teenagers. It's that I need God in my life. I need God to be the center of my home. And when God's the center of my home, then God becomes the center of my teenager's life. If you want God's ideal, you got to seek the Lord. You got to go to God. You got to go to God. You can find just about anything you're looking for now on the internet. And recently, I say recently, the last couple of years... We have purchased an inordinate amount of things from Facebook Marketplace. Do you know what this is? This is a digital garage sale. It feels like a yard sale. And we buy and sell things on Facebook Marketplace. And a couple of years ago, I had to tell Brandy, quit giving our address to strangers to come buy things for $4. Somebody's going to kill us in this house because you sold a $4 rug to somebody on the internet. Y'all with me on this, everybody? I'm fired up about that. I, don't come to my house. I'll meet you at Bucky's. If you're going to kill me, you're going to do it in front of everybody. <laughs> but you can, you can find anything. If you need good golf clubs, you can find golf clubs on Facebook Marketplace. If you, you can find recommendations for anything. You can find a good restaurant. If you want a good Tex-Mex restaurant, you can find a good Tex-Mex restaurant. You just ask everybody on the internet. If you, if you, if you want to if you, if you, you find uh, uh, something that you lost, you can find. If you find your, your car keys, you lose them, you can find them eventually. If, if you search hard enough, you can find anything that you want in your life. And the, thing, the same thing's true in your spiritual life. Listen to me. Write this down. Matthew 6, 33. If seek first God's kingdom and his righteousness. And then you'll find the other stuff you've been looking for. The problem is we get this so out of whack that we go looking for the benefits instead of the benefactor. We start looking for blessings instead of the blessor. And the Bible says, Jesus said, Matthew 6, if you'll seek the Lord first, that he'd take care of your family and he'd take care of your marriage. And Let me say it like this. This will be the best year of your life if it's the best year of your spiritual life. <coughs> this could be the best year of your marriage if it's the best year of your spiritual life. This could be the best year you've parented if it's your best spiritual life. The Bible says it like this, that as your soul prospers, I pray that everything else would prosper in your life. But you've got to get God first. You got to seek the Lord first. And if you seek God, then you get God's best. And this is true for everybody, no matter what your family dynamic. How many of you are single? All the single people wave at me. Come on, single people, wave at me. Look around. This is what you're working with. <laughs> uh, uh, come to the next service. There's more single people in that service, too. If I was single looking for somebody, I'd come to all three. You know what I mean? Just kind of scope it out. You know? <laughs> oh, Jesus. If you're not married yet, listen, there's something worse than being single. It's marrying the wrong person. <laughs> you know who just amen? Married people. <laughs> uh, something worse than you can you can you can be satisfied in singleness 
If you're single, let me say it like this. Write it down if you're single. I'm going to seek God first. I'm not going to seek a spouse first. I'm going to seek God first. I'm going to become the person that the person I'm looking for is looking for. I always get tickled at people that say, Pastor, I want a man of God. I want a woman of God. I want somebody that prays. I want somebody that tithes. I want somebody that serves. I want... I want somebody that loves God and I look at your life and you don't pray, tithe, serve, or love God. What? Listen, are you becoming the person that the person you're looking for is looking for? How? I'm going to seek God first. If you want a blessed marriage, if you want to serve God together, if you want successful kids, you want financial blessing, if you want to make an eternal difference as a couple, don't seek those things, become Adamant on I'm seeking God first in my season of singleness. Say amen to that, everybody. I'll seek God first. Any married people? Wave your hand. Y'all better know. Y'all better wave. Anybody been married longer than 20 years? Where you at? 30 years? 40 years? Jesus. How did you? That's good. That's all right. I met somebody in the other service today, married 60 years. How do you, how do you, how do you last that long? What do, you, what do you do? Well, it's a four letter word. W-O-R-K, it's just work. Are y'all with me on that, everybody? It's just work. Is it work, Pat and Karen? How many years? 46 years, that's a long time to live with Pat Hewlett. Uh, I'm going to regret that. <laughs> I'm going to seek God. Write this down if you're married. I will seek God with my spouse. You want to know the key? to? I, I, I'm picking on the Hewlett. I know them. I know them. I know 46 years of seeking the Lord. I know what you see now is not what it started with. I know it's 46 years of ups and downs and good days and bad days and good years and bad years, plenty and lack. And together, 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 you just seek the Lord together. You just seek the Lord together. Let me, can I tell you married people, look at me. It's hard to divorce somebody you pray with. It's almost impossible to hate people you pray for. Almost impossible. I'll say further than that. Look at me. It's almost impossible to have an affair on somebody you pray with. Because as soon as you want to send that, and then I'm going to seek God with my spouse. And I know you think, man, this seems corny. I don't even know how to do this. I, are we supposed to hold hands? What are we supposed to do? I'm going to seek God together. I'm going to seek God. With, I know it's difficult. I know it feels tough. I, I, I'll tell you how to seek God together. But I read a survey that surveyed a thousand Christian couples and fewer than 8% of a thousand Christian couples prayed together every day. And those that did, of the 8% of Christian couples that prayed together, the 8% of a thousand, only 1% of that 8% divorced. Because it's, it's hard to hate somebody you pray with. It's hard to hate somebody you're seeking God with. Don't just buy a house. Seek the Lord about buying a house. Don't just change jobs. Seek the Lord about changing jobs. Don't just buy a car. Seek the Lord. Don't just have kids because it sounds fun. It ain't fun. (laughs) Seek the Lord. How many of you got kids? Here's what I want you to know as your pastor. There's no pain like kid pain. There's no pain like kid pain. You would do anything to take pain from your children and wear it on yourself. Am I I telling the truth? No pain like kid pain. But you may be in church today. The band's coming. You may be in church today thinking, man, I got kid pain. It's my my teenagers, my 20-somethings. Man, I don't know what's going on. I don't know what to do. I don't know how to fix this. I don't know what to do. Write it down if you're a parent. I'm going to seek God with my children. Not very deep today. I'm just giving some practical Bible teaching about living... 
blessed family. I'm going to seek God with my children. It doesn't mean you got to sit down and have devotion time. It just means we're going to weave the Lord in everything that we do. I pray for my children every single day, every single day, every single day, every single day. By name, last night. Bedtime, we have an early bedtime. Saturday nights because Sunday's church and I take my kids upstairs. My two babies' rooms are upstairs and I tuck them in. Y'all still do that? Y'all know what tucking them in means? I don't even know what that means, but we say we tuck them in. I knelt down at my 10-year-old little boy's bedside. Laid my hands on his head like I've done for 10 years. Prayed in tongues over my son every day of his life. Every day of his life. Why? Because I'm not going to wait till he's 18 and send him off to college and hope he gets it. I'm going to do it when he's 9 and 10 years old and show him how to seek the Lord together. So that when he's old, he will not depart. Are you all with me on this, everybody? I'm going to train up a child in the way he should go. I'm going to seek the Lord with my children every day. What does it look like, Pastor? Let me give you five things. I didn't put them on the screen to seek the Lord together. You ought to pray together. You ought to read the Bible together. You ought to worship together. You ought to be in a small group together. Small groups lunch next week, and you ought to serve together. I can help you get connected to serving tonight at Welcome Home. A ton of people are coming tonight to join not just the church, but join a dream team, serve together. Uh, uh, next week, we're going to launch a dozen small groups. You need to find a small group together. You need to read the Bible, worship, pray, be in a small group, and serve together. We'll be seeking the Lord together. And what happens when we do that? I'm glad that you asked. Here's the last thing I'll say and then I'll pray. First Chronicles 28 and 9. First Chronicles 28 and 9 says it like this. Worship and serve the Lord with all your heart, with your whole heart and a willing mind. Because the Lord sees your heart and knows your plan and every thought. And watch this. If you seek Him, you will find Him. You will. Listen, close your Bibles. Look at me. There's no preconditions on finding Him. You don't have to come from a healthy marriage to find the Lord. You don't have to come from a great example of fatherhood to find the Lord in your current situation. You don't have to come from a healthy example. You could come from dysfunction and fighting and cussing and fussing and abandonment and abuse and molestation. You can come from all kinds of stuff and that doesn't mean it got to come from you because if you'll seek the Lord, you will find Him right where you are and you can have the blessed life. You can live a blessed family and just because you didn't come from that doesn't mean it can't come from you and that's what I want in your life. Do you want that in your life? Everybody, you want that in your life? All right, stand up. Stand up, take your spouse by the hand, wrap your hands around your babies. Come on. Family prayer together. Family prayer together. Every family member, if you're here single, find a friend. Put your arm around them, bow your heads. We're gonna seek the Lord together. It sounds like this. Father, I thank you. I thank you for my spouse. I thank you for my wife, my husband. I thank you for 46 years of marriage, 25 years of marriage. Thank you for two healthy kids. Thank you for the blessing of the Lord. Thank you for this business. Thank you for how you've blessed us. Thank you for our health. Thank you that I'm still here. Thank you that the devil didn't take us out. Thank you that we could have lost it all and we're still here. I thank you, God, for delivering us. I thank you that even though we didn't come from function, that function's going to come from us. I thank you that even though we didn't come from health and faith, that health and faith is going to come from us. God, we seek you together. We seek you together. We Come on, single people, I seek the Lord. In my season of singleness, I seek the Lord. I'm seeking the Lord with my children. I'm seeking the Lord with my family. I'm teaching and showing. We're going to go to God first. We're going to go to God first. And if we seek Him, we will find Him today. Father, I pray a, a, a blessing. I pray the blessing of the Lord on every family, whatever that family looks like. I pray for single adults, divorced, single again. I pray for widows and widowers who are struggling. I pray for people who feel orphaned, parents who've left or died. I pray for grandparents raising kids, aunts and uncles who are stepping in as mom and dad. I pray today for families 
who have all kinds of different backgrounds and scenarios and come from all kinds of different places. But today, they're surrendering to the Lord, surrendering their family unit to God. God, I thank you for adoptive families, for children. I thank you today for families who open their hearts to fostering. I thank you today for families who are believing again that God could heal and restore the years that we've wasted years the enemy stole. I believe you for that kind of blessing today. Now if you've never given your heart to the Lord, let me lead you to Jesus. Because you really can't seek the blessing until you found the blessor. You really can't have the blessing of God on your life if you don't have God in your life. So your heads are still bowed and eyes are still closed and maybe you're in church today thinking, I I know I'm not lost. I'm not, I know I'm not right. I know my heart isn't where it should be. I know that my relationship with God isn't where it should be. Maybe you're a Christian today and thinking I've disconnected, cold, carnal, walked away, ready to come home. The thing I love about the God of the Bible is you may see the ideal in Scripture and think, man, we're falling short. There's always grace in the gap oh that's there's always grace in the gap and if you're here today thinking my heart isn't where it's supposed to be there's grace for you all you got to do is give your heart to Jesus he'll meet you right where you are we believe he'll save you make you brand new today today so if you need to do that and come home our whole church will pray this with you but we cannot pray it for you so out loud from the depths of your soul say Lord Jesus thank you for the cross for dying in my place paying for my sin I believe God raised you from the dead that I can live in heaven eternally now here's the part that's between you and the Lord and you and the Lord only out loud would you say I repent of my sins I turn from my sin I give you my past my mistakes my choices my habits my hang ups and I give you my future my plans, my hopes, and my dreams. Save me today. Forgive me today. Cleanse me today. Make me brand new. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. I give you my whole life for the rest of my life. In Jesus' name, and everybody shouted amen. Come on, give him praise for his word.